Hi, welcome to today's video. Before I start, I have big news for my birthday. I got a cat. Wait, here she is. Her name is Milky, and I really hope she will let me film this video today. So we'll see how that goes. In today's video, I want to show you how you can use your cognitive functions as a part of shadow work. And the reason I want to use this is because I find that it gives structure to something that is otherwise so intangible. Because if someone tells you to just integrate your suppressed self in order to realize your unique potential, you might wonder, what does that mean? What does any of that mean? And looking at your function stack can actually answer a lot of these questions. All of this becomes a lot easier once you know what your unique potential looks like, which is the combination of your whole stack and what suppressed parts of yourself you need to work on to get there, which is represented in your inferior function. But to start this video, I first want to briefly go over what is shadow work. One of my favorite quotes from Jung is, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And I really love this because if you are the creator of your life, then why isn't your life exactly what you want it to be? If it were really as simple as knowing what you want and going after it, then why do we keep getting in our own ways? Why do we keep holding ourselves back in life, even if it's against our best interest? All of these are questions I've asked myself for a very long time. I couldn't understand why I didn't just do the things I knew I should. And the answer I found to that question is really simple. It's because the life you live is the result of not only your conscious motivations, but also your unconscious motivations. In other words, your shadow. So the only way you can change is by confronting this invisible saboteur or these unconscious motivations that are coming from your shadow. So let's start there. What is the shadow? I'll give you another quote that explains this pretty well. Within each of us lies two parts of a whole, the person we want to be and some part of us that conflicts with that ideal version of ourselves. Think about the person you want to be. How do they act? How do they look? What's their attitude like? And now think of the person you are right now. How are you different from this? Perhaps you feel you're not as confident or as smart or as disciplined as you want to be. And it's behind each of these discrepancies that you will find your shadow. It's this other you that you're always in conflict with. You're always trying to fight it and to push it back as it contains all the parts of yourself that you've suppressed or never had the chance to realize in the first place. But it's a part of you nonetheless, and this is why there is power in your shadow. I often see there's such a misconception that the shadow is something that is evil or bad or should be destroyed, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Your shadow is the part of you that you don't live. Sure, it may be destructive and unproductive, but that's only because it's stuck in this immature state. And if you can retrieve it, if you can develop it and actually use it, it contains the seeds to your potential. Before going into this more, it's important to note that Jung was an essentialist, which means that he believed you are born with all of the pieces to your personality, and ideally, you get to live these and develop them throughout your life. And it's through developing and expressing each of these parts that you get to realize this potential. But real life looks very differently. The first objective of life is in self-realization, it's survival. And since we are social creatures, our survival, especially when we're young, completely depends on being accepted by other people. So very quickly, we learn what parts of ourselves are seen as good and as bad in the society we grow up in. So as you grow up, you get older, you experiment with expressing these different parts of yourselves and you, or I should better say your ego, learns to then sort these into piles of good and bad. And the parts of yourself that are met with love and praise, you learn to embrace in your personality as good, and you get to develop them, you learn to control them. 
However, the parts of yourself that are met with rejection and criticism make you fear for your own survival, so you sort them out as bad. You suppress them and you push them away every time they come to the surface until eventually they fall into the unconscious. They become a part of your shadow. I realize that all this talk about the shadow and unique potential may still seem very intangible and difficult to apply to real life. So to give you a bit of a working framework, I want to take a look at one of the most important yet forgotten parts of Jungian psychology, which is conscious attitude. So the ego is the center of your consciousness. Its whole role is to deal with problems. To give you an example for this, I want to read you a bit from the book Modern Man in Search of a Soul. So the question is, how does a person react to an obstacle? For instance, we come to a brook where there is no bridge, the stream is too broad to step across, and we must jump. To make this possible, we have at our disposal a complicated functional system, namely the psychomotor system. It is completely developed and needs only to be released, but before this happens, something of a purely psychic nature takes place. That is, the decision is made about what is to be done. This is to say that just as the psychomotor apparatus is automatically at our disposal, so there is an exclusively psychic apparatus ready for our use in the making of decisions, which works also by habit and therefore unconsciously. Opinions differ very widely as to what this apparatus is like. It is certain only that every individual has his accustomed way of meeting decisions and of dealing with difficulties. One person will say he jumped the brook for the fun of the thing, another that it was because there was no alternative. A third, that every obstacle he meets challenges him to overcome it. A fourth person does not jump the brook because he hates useless effort. And a fifth refrained because he saw no urgent necessity for crossing to the other side. I have purposefully chosen this commonplace example in order to show how irrelevant these incentives seem. They appear so futile indeed that we push them all to one side and are inclined to substitute our own explanation. And yet it is just these variants that furnish us with valuable insight into the individual systems of psychic adaptation. If we examine other situations of life, the person who crossed the brook because it gave him pleasure to jump, we shall probably find that for the most part what he does and omits to do can be explained in terms of the pleasure it gives him. We shall observe that the one who sees no other means of getting across goes through life carefully, but unwillingly, always making reluctant decisions. So in this little snippet, Jung explains that there is something within the psyche that determines the decisions we make, the way we react to the world around us. And since the earliest of times, we've tried to understand these differences in people through different classifications, whether that's through oriental astrology or the four dispositions of antiquity. There have been so many different ways of trying to type personality, and this is exactly what Jung attempted through his theory of conscious attitude. So what exactly is the conscious attitude? To put it simply, your conscious attitude describes your ego's basic tendencies for making decisions. Your ego plays such an important role in your day-to-day -day life. It's responsible for making decisions, for dealing with social situations and overcoming challenges. It's also in direct contact with your conscious awareness, so your ego is aware of everything that's happening around you. And your conscious attitude refers to the way in which your ego interacts with the other parts of your psyche. It dictates which psychological functions are emphasized in your conscious awareness. Now, if you're into personality typing, this may sound familiar to you. According to Jung, each person has their own way of processing information and making decisions, and he has categorized these differences into eight cognitive functions. And these are divided into two main categories. The first are judging functions, and the second are perceiving functions. And each of these, so four functions altogether, has either an inward, introverted orientation or an outward extroverted orientation. Now this gives us eight cognitive functions in total and I won't be going through each one of these just because there's so many resources you can find online or in books or you can read Jung's Psychological Types which is the sixth volume of his collected works and it goes over all this. So Jung has established these eight functions that describe these different tendencies in people. 
but he's found that this still isn't enough. You might have two people who are introverted thinkers and they will still react very differently to the same obstacle. And this is where he takes the idea further and has created the function stack. Each of us has a unique function stack that consists of four conscious primary functions, and they're ranked by their level of development and use. Your function stack determines how you interact with the world around you. So let me give you a quick overview of the four functions which make up your psychological type. The first function is the hero function, also known as your dominant function. It is the most powerful cognitive function in your personality, and it's what gives you your sense of identity and stability in life. It helps you in everyday decision making. It's your go-to strategy for dealing with anything that comes up. At the top of your function stack, your hero function dictates the direction and focus of your life. It's the most conscious and reliable part of your personality, so this is the area where you will feel your strengths in. This is your area of expertise. You will usually rely on your hero function for everyday or challenging situations, and it's where you feel most confident in. For example, an INFJ with introverted intuition, NI as their hero function, will naturally focus on future possibilities and patterns and insights in life. This is their first mode of perceiving the world. Since your hero function is the first to develop in your stack, it's often the personality you see taking shape in children. It is the first step of your differentiation from other people. And this is why your persona is so heavily shaped by your dominant function, because it's how you perceive yourself. Now, the second function in your stack is the auxiliary or parent function. Your parent function is there to complement and stabilize the dominant trait in your personality, and it also offers a different perspective because it will be the opposite mode from your dominant function. For instance, if your dominant function is judging, then your parent function will be perceiving and vice versa. As the second function in the stack, the parent acts as a counterbalance to your dominant hero function. Whereas your hero is all about self-expression, your parent is there to bring responsibility and guidance towards it. In the same INFJ example, their effy, extroverted feeling parent allows them to consider the social impact and the feelings of others in their plans. There's a reason INFJs make such great therapists and cult leaders, and it's because they're able to understand others in this way. So the parent function usually starts to develop during adolescence, and it it goes on into adulthood. So developing your parent function will also help the hero mature and be more responsible in its decision making. Now, the third function is the tertiary or child function, which embodies a less developed but playful aspect of your personality. This function can bring joy and creativity into your life, but it can also be a source of vulnerability and naivety if it's not properly balanced. The child function is the third in your stack, and it represents a midpoint between your conscious and unconscious influences, which is why it can bring in this new energy and inspiration. And your child function is often the way that you will find comfort and safety in life. Whatever big visions or plans your hero sets out to pursue and your parent will help it achieve this, your child function is there to help you do this in a more creative and fulfilling way, and it can also help prevent you from burning out. For example, an INFJ with introverted thinking as their child function might use logic and analytical thinking as a way to find creative solutions to the problems in their life. And they might also find a lot of hobbies or ways to use these qualities in their pastime through things like crosswords, puzzles, or strategy games. I like to think of the child function as a hidden talent that you have up your sleeve that you may be aware of and quite comfortable with, but other people might not immediately recognize this in you. This is, for example, how ENTPs with their extroverted feeling child function are surprisingly good at reading people, even though you might not see this at first. So the child function tends to develop naturally over time. And while it doesn't need as much attention as for example, the hero or parent function, when you do develop it, it can really help you become more adaptable and resilient in life.
Now, the fourth and last function in your function stack is the inferior or aspirational function. The inferior function represents the least developed and least conscious aspect of your cognitive stack. It acts as the Achilles heel of your personality, and it's often the source of a lot of challenges and vulnerabilities. As the inferior function is the fourth function in your stack, it lies within the unconscious realm. But even though it's mostly unconscious, because it is still a part of your conscious stack, you can develop it. You can bring it into your conscious personality. This function often shows up in times of stress, and it is a source of all of these fears and insecurities and limiting beliefs that come from your shadow. This is why it can be so powerful when used in integrating your shadow. For example, if you have an inferior extroverted sensation function, then you may most of the time neglect this part of your life. You may become so caught up in other things that you completely forget your physical environment. You may forget to eat, sleep, you may forget to take care of your room, your appearances, all of these things that are demands on you of the present. But when times are tough and you become so stressed that you struggle to use your dominant functions, then you may start to overuse this function. And this is where you start to have an excessive, almost unhealthy focus on the senses. You may then fall into things like overeating, overexercising, spending a bunch of money, going out and seeking any kind of immediate physical sensation. And this will usually have a very unproductive impact on your life because you're not using it in a controlled way. It's coming from a very immature state. So until you develop it, you typically over or overuse your inferior function, neither of which are particularly great. You don't usually develop your inferior function until later in life because it comes up through stress and personal challenges and it's through engaging in with it like this that you get the chance to develop this function. But since it's the biggest source of your self-sabotage, when you do develop it, you will gain a lot more control over your life. Now, to sum all of this up, your strongest quality is your dominant function. This is what will guide you towards your path in life and act as your drive. And your parent function, if developed, will help you do so responsibly so that it isn't just a dream. Now, your child function is an additional stabilizing element that adds creativity to your vision and, more importantly, allows you to find joy in it. If developed, your child function will help you follow your dream with persistence and without burning out in doing so. And finally, your inferior function is the greatest source of stress and frustration, but it must be developed in order to make your dream a reality. It's the missing counterpart to your dominant function, and if developed, they can cover each other's blind spots. But as long as your inferior function is missing or underdeveloped, this will be the way in which you self-sabotage. So if you can understand your function stack, you can start to recognize the same patterns you get stuck in, such as your fears and insecurities and limiting beliefs. All of these things come from your shadow and they show up through your inferior function because that's where there's an imbalance. This is the part of yourself that you continually suppress and all of this just piles up and creates a whole host of problems. A lot of the time, these problems that we experience in the external world are just projections of the conflicts we experience internally, such as repressions. And this is why a lot of the problems we experience in life are related to our inferior function. It's a big part of what we suppress in ourselves. It's the opposite of our dominant function, the opposite of what we embrace in our persona. And because of this, it's a ripe ground for our shadow. Now, everything that is conscious, we tend to have good control over, and everything that is unconscious will be poorly developed and require effort to integrate. So the opposites of your dominant functions will be your blind spots. And as a result, absolutely everything that cannot reach your consciousness because of your conscious attitude will fall into your shadow. And as your inferior function is the least conscious in your attitude, it acts as a backdoor to your shadow. This is the area that most problems will slip through and then later show up as self-sabotage. But your inferior function is also called your aspirational function because it has the most potential for you if developed. 
if you want to focus on just one area to have the greatest benefit towards integrating your shadow, then that would be developing your inferior function. Your inferior function represents the least developed aspect of your personality. It's usually your weakest function and it can feel stressful to rely on it, which is why it's usually repressed and underutilized. You may feel a lot of pressure to use your inferior function. It's an area you want to be better in and it's often the very qualities you admire most in others, but it can be very stressful when trying to use this in yourself. Now, your ego, remember the ego's role is selecting and rejecting information. So your ego tends to select traits that are aligned with your dominant function for your persona. And conversely, traits that are associated with its opposite, your inferior function, are suppressed and rejected because they don't align with this image that your ego wants to project. And this is exactly why Jung stressed the development of your inferior function so much, because it's still a part of your inherent personality, even when you reject it. It's still a fundamental part of who you are, and it's needed in order for your other functions to be able to work together harmoniously. And I'll give you an example for this. If you have inferior extroverted thinking, then when making your plans, you may neglect thinking logically about it. You may struggle with discipline and consistency. You may struggle when working together with other people. And it's in all of these areas that your fears and inferiorities will develop. You may then start to have limiting beliefs such as, I'll just give up on it anyways, or I'm not disciplined enough, or what if they judge me or think badly of me? And all of these things, all of these fears are related to that same inferior function because it's these qualities that are missing in your personality. That's why you feel it as an inferiority. And if you can recognize this, if you can recognize that this is the source of a lot of your fears and insecurities, then you can address it. And this is how you get rid of these things through developing your inferior function. As I mentioned, Jung believed that individuals are born with a predisposition towards certain cognitive functions, and this is what forms the basis of your personality type. So your cognitive function stack is like the blueprint for your unique potential. And obviously there's so much more to personality, and that's exactly why I say blueprint because it shows the structure of who you are. What this potential will look like when it's fully built, that's up to you, and that depends so much on everything else in your personality. But your function stack is how your mind works, and by learning about this, you can start to understand all of your own strengths and weaknesses and untapped talents. You can recognize where you self-sabotage and what exactly you need to work on in order to overcome this. And this isn't the same thing as generic self-help advice where one person is saying, hey, this worked for me, because it's specifically based on your personality. You can think of your cognitive functions as the tools you have in your hand. And these are the tools you've been given, so you want to learn how to use each of them because it's when you can use them all together efficiently, that is what you need in order to realize your full potential. And the order in your function stack is very important as well, because each of your conscious functions provide a complementary perspective to one another. For example, someone with dominant introverted feeling will need the support of extroverted thinking in order to execute their plans, in order to make those dreams a reality. And the same can be said for the opposite. Someone with dominant extroverted thinking may be very good at creating plans and acting on them, but without the support of introverted feeling as a counter perspective, they might not know what they value and what is actually meaningful for them to pursue. So in both of these examples, that opposite perspective is what's needed in order for you to find real fulfillment. Your dominant and inferior function need to work together in harmony to support each other's blind spots in order for you to realize your unique potential. Remember, your shadow in its nature is an inferiority, and an inferiority only comes when something is a part of you, but it hasn't been developed yet, so it may show up in unproductive ways. So whether you want to work on your inferior type or not, it will always be there. It's a part of you. It doesn't just go away, even if you choose to ignore it. 
but you can ignore it, in which case you will keep falling into the same problems and patterns over and over again, or you can decide to strengthen this part of your personality and use it. So how do you develop your inferior function? Fortunately, I think it's a lot easier to do than a lot of other shadow work practices just because it's a more practical way of going about it. So I've broken this down into three steps and this time I've also included them in the description if you want to check it out there. Now, the first step is recognizing your inferior function. This should be obvious. You want to figure out what your inferior function is. And there are a few ways to do this, but assuming you'll be doing this on your own, here's my advice. I recommend reading about all eight cognitive functions to just get an understanding of them and how they work differently. And then you want to see what resonates with you, which of these qualities do you recognize in yourself? And it can be really helpful to get other people's input on this as well. As Jung says, we must admit that everyone else probably understands us better than we do ourselves. Because otherwise, you might end up judging this through the image of your persona, the image of who you want to be. This is why people often get personality typing tests wrong, because you're answering through this persona, not who you actually are. And it can be hard to recognize that in yourself. So people who you trust and who might know you well can really help with this. Now, if you know your MBTI type, which was based on Jung's cognitive functions, you can also use this as a guideline to figure out your function stack. This is what I've been using for examples throughout this video. I'll also explain how you can do this in the description. Anyways, once you have your inferior function, you want to study it. Read everything you can about it online, in books. Like I said, Jung Psychological Types is great for this. And start reflecting on how this shows up in your life. How your self-sabotaging behaviors might be linked to it. Is this an area of your life where you feel a lot of stress and conflict? You want to start understanding your relationship to this function. Now, the second step is to practice using your inferior qualities. Once you know what your inferior function is, you can get a good picture of how it's used, and these are exactly the activities you want to lean into to get more experience and practice using this function. A lot of the times, these can be the very things you avoid or hate doing, but the only way to change this is by doing it. So accept that it may suck, it may be uncomfortable, but you will also get better at it. For example, my boyfriend is an ENTP, so both of us are pretty low on extroverted thinking, TE, and this is related to all things that require planning, detail work, organization. It's definitely a struggle, but at least for me, this is an area of potential development in my stack. So I try to use the exercise and embrace these little challenges to try to get better at it. Extroverted thinking is all about managing the external. So things like meal planning, organizing social events, which is something I'm very bad at, but I feel quite proud when I'm able to do it. Or sticking to time schedules, which is another area I find very difficult, but I notice how much it helps me when I do it. This is also why I feel that our inferior function is so important for us, because even though we may hate it and avoid using it, it's often the very thing we need in order to feel grounded, in order to be able to use our other functions in a healthy way. And communication is another big part of TE, such as presenting ideas in a logical and concise way, which is something I practice in these videos, but it's definitely not natural to me, and it requires a lot of effort to build up. But it's one of those four supporting pillars. It's a part of my vision, so I have to learn to do it. And lastly, step number three is to embrace your inferior function in your self-concept. Now, self-concept is something I've talked about before in my other videos, but it's just like your persona. It's the conscious image you have of yourself. And the thing about self-concept is that it's at the very top. Everything starts with self-concept. So the way you see yourself affects the beliefs you have, and your beliefs affect your thoughts and what you end up choosing to do or avoiding in your life, which then affects the experience you have 
and that feeds back into your self-concept. So it's like a loop. And a lot of the time this happens unconsciously. We're not even aware of it. So this loop can be very negative for us. And this is how your inferior function usually shows up. You may suppress these inferior function qualities in yourself. You don't recognize this in yourself. So for example, with inferior TE, you may start to think, I'm not a very disciplined person. And then you start to form limiting beliefs from this. I'm not able to be consistent with things. I never follow through and so on. And then you avoid situations where you could get this experience. And then that feeds back into your self-concept. So you can get stuck in these cycles and the way to break out of it, the way to develop your inferior function is to embrace these parts in the way that you see yourself. So when going out and getting practice when engaging with your inferior function, you also want to be reaffirming this to yourself. You want to think, okay, this is something I am new at. I may not be very good, but I will get better. This is who I am. I'm just learning to do it. And accept that you won't be perfect. That's just the nature of it. You can think of it like a child because you will make mistakes. It takes a lot of time and practice to develop a function to maturity. And I also find here that affirmations can be so helpful with this because they play a part in that loop. It's repetition of thought, which then affects your beliefs and it has an impact on the experiences you go and seek out. And then once you get positive experiences, this feeds back in with your self-concept and it starts to change everything in your life. So I know this might be a lot. I tried to keep it as concise as possible. I really love working with cognitive functions for shadow work because it reveals exactly what you need to be working on in order to reach your unique potential. It's like a little handbook to your own mind and you can actually have a very specific goal in front of you and know what steps to take to reach it. So I hope this helps. Let me know your thoughts and questions in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.